on behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia series and our sponsor, Unchained Labs, I'd like to welcome you to explore AAV formulation and stability with Big Tuna and Uncle. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'm the host and moderator for today's event. Now I'd like to welcome our presenters for today. First is Donna Chen, Product Manager with Unchained Labs. And our second presenter is Ross Walton, PhD, Application Scientist Analytics with Unchained Labs. Welcome, Donna. The presenter ball is yours. Thank you, Elizabeth, for the introduction. Hi, and welcome to our webinar. I'm Donna, the product manager for Big Tuna. Together with Ross, we'll be exploring the two tools to help you fast track AAV formulation and stability characterization using Big Tuna and Uncle today. AV development is a lot like playing with pinatas. During process development, we blindly batter the capsid with all kinds of stresses, hoping to find a condition to stabilize AAV. Wouldn't it be nice if we can see clearly when it happens? We're going to talk about how we can help to take off that blindfold so you can characterize AAV stability and development process and formulation with clear vision. The big questions to developing stable AAVs are, is my virus aggregated? And is the capsid still intact? These two questions impacts everything from capsid design, formulation and process development, and more importantly, product potency and safety. To fast track process development and characterization of the AAV product, we in Unchained have the perfect pair of tools. Big turn out to fully automate buffer exchange and prepare your AAV samples into the right working concentration range, and Uncle to answer the two big questions of aggregation and capsid integrity. You can't get away from doing buffer exchange. From protein therapeutics development to AAV engineering, it is everywhere. After the production from cell line, before going to the analytics and selecting the right formulation. Dialysis, centrifugation, and TFF methods are great techniques for method development if you only have a couple samples to work with. But if you, are, if you have many, many samples or buffer types you want to get through, none of these uh, methods are ideal. Originally created to help break through the bottlenecks of protein manual buffer exchange method, we find Big Tuna to work just as well as an automated versatile buffer exchange system to help you power through buffer exchange and sample concentration for AAV and other virus-like particles. It can exchange or concentrate up to 96 samples in one single run, can handle sample volume as low as 100 microliter to 8 ml. It is designed to be super simple to use, all you need is 30 minutes of prep time from designing the experiment and to prepare the deck. Big Tuna will take care of the, all the exchange automatically, so you can walk away and come back to a finished sample. Big Tuna is a filtration plate-based buffer exchange system. It uses two regenerated cellulose membrane plates, the unfiltered 96 and unfiltered 24, to perform the buffer exchange. Both play types are in standard SBS format, so fully compatible with any automation system. The unfiltered 96 is in the 96 well play format and has the working volume range of 100 microliter to 450 microliter. And the unfiltered 24 is in the 24 well play format that has a larger working volume range from 450 microliter to AML. The unfiltered 96 has four molecular weight cutoff options ranging from 3 to 100 kDa, and unfiltered 24 has only 10 kDa option. How does Big Tuna automate buffer exchange? It is a pressure-based ultrafiltration and diafiltration method that is combined with three unique components, a pressure chamber, an acoustic volume sensor, and an orbital mixer. Big Tuna's buffer exchange starts when you place a sample fill filtration plate inside the positive pressure chamber. An acoustic volume sensor will start to measure each well to get the initial volume before positive pressure is applied to remove the filtrate. The amount of filter cycle is dependent on your percentage removal setting. After the estimated set amount of filtrate is removed, the volume sensor will measure the amount left in the well 
and replenish the remove volume with a new buffer. The steps of pressurize to remove filtrate, measure volume remove, and replenish amount remove will be in cycle iterations until the old buffer is completely replaced by the new buffer. All the while the sample is under pressure, there's a gentle orbital mixing action going on to make, the buff to make sure the buffer exchange process is faster. The orbital mixer increases the buffer exchange speed by stirring the particle up during the filtration to prevent concentration gradient buildup and minimize the risk of clogged wells. Now that we know how Big Tuna works to speed up buffer exchange for AAV, I will let Ross talk about how UNCLE can help characterize AAV stability. Thanks, Donna, for that really great introduction to Big Tuna. Hi, everyone. My name's Ross, and I'm one of the application scientists here at Unchained Labs working with our analytical instruments. Donna's done a great job of talking to you about using Big Tuna to do many buffer exchanges of AAV into lots of different buffers or formulations. But now you might be thinking, how am I going to characterize all these samples once I've made them? If you're used to just doing functional assays, you know, either infectivity assays or transduction assays, you know that those can take a long time and characterizing that many samples is just going to take forever. Doing thermal stability with UNCLE takes a lot less time, typically only a few hours. It can do 48 samples at once and only requires nine microliters of, sam of each sample in order to do a full thermal stability characterization. UNCLE is an all-in-one multimodal stability platform that's built for biologics and contains three different detection methods. UNCLE has full spectrum fluorescence along with two different wavelength lasers to give you a full picture of capsid stability with or without labels. With its 266 nanometer laser, it's able to, uh, you can use UNCLE to excite the intrinsic fluorescence of capsid proteins and thereby determine when those proteins start to unfold and when your capsid gets disrupted, at what temperature your capsid gets disrupted. UNCLE also has a 473 nanometer laser, which can be used to excite a variety of fluorescent dyes, uh, including DNA binding dyes, which is a really useful assay for looking at DNA release or ejection from AAV capsids. Those two lasers are also used for static light scattering, or SLS, which is a way of detecting aggregate formation during a thermal ramp at the same time that UNCLE is already collecting that fluorescence data. The last detection method that UNCLE contains is dynamic light scattering, or DLS, which is a way of looking at the size and distribution of sizes of particles in a solution, either before or after a thermal ramp, and is really helpful for getting a clear picture of the quality of a sample, uh, a quality of AAV, and checking for aggregates before you do any sort of uh, heating. Lastly, UNCLE contains very precise temperature control, and therefore can use any of these three methods, either uh, during a thermal ramp, isothermally, during a stepped ramp, or really any sort of uh, design of heating that you can possibly imagine. UNCLE can look at capsid stability and aggregation of AAVs of up to 48 samples at a time in only two hours and uses only nine microliters per, uh, of sample per run. You might be wondering how that's all that's possible. Well, it all starts with its uh, sample holder, which we call the uni. Each uni contains 16 wells, which are actually quartz cuvettes, cylindrical quartz cuvettes that are hollow on either side. And each one of those cuvettes holds nine microliters. During an experiment, you can load anywhere from one to 16 of those wells in a uni, and then seal it in this blue frame in between these two silicone seals. That holds the sample in place, prevents any sort of evaporation or any sort of mixing between the samples, and seals it so that it's nice and safe. Your AV is nice and safe sealed inside those silicone seals. Really, it's this uni that makes UNCLE so unique, uh, providing that high throughput with uh, small sample volumes, which is so important when you're working with AAV. UNCLE can look at two different kinds of stability, either capsid stability 
or aggregation using this combination of full spectrum fluorescence, SLS, and DLS. Capsid stability can actually be broken down into two different scenarios, which we'll go into in a little bit, but just generally, uh, there's capsid disruption in which the capsid breaks apart and genome ejection in which the single strand DNA inside of AAV gets ejected from a more or less intact capsid. UNCLE contains tools that you can actually look at both of those uh, stability events and tell what's going on at uh, any temperature. Looking at aggregation, of course, AV can aggregate uh, with intact, you know, intact capsids sticking together, or it'll aggregate once the capsid is disrupted and all of those capsids of proteins, protein monomers, will just stick together in a big mass. Uncle can use SLS to look at aggregation during a thermal ramp, or it can look uh, use DLS to look at aggregation before a thermal ramp at time zero, which gives you a pretty good snapshot of whether your sample was of high quality to begin with and what happens to it during a thermal ramp. Typically, you're going to want to have your cap, your uh, AV particles be nice, uniform, and monodispersed before a thermal ramp in order to get a good understanding of what happens during uh, to its capsid stability during the thermal ramp. Let's look a little bit closer at these two different methods of, uh, these two different models of capsid stability. And look at some of the evidence in the literature that supports both capsid disruption and genome ejection. In this paper from 2018, the authors used atomic force microscopy or AFM to directly image AAV that was going through these two different stability pathways. So at the top of the screen in the purple box, you can see intact capsids as imaged by AFM. The authors heated this sample and then measured it again with atomic force microscopy and saw this middle uh, green boxed morphologies of a sort of white thread of DNA connected to an, uh, a bright white ball, which is most likely DNA that had been ejected from an intact AAV capsid. The authors also saw what they called compact DNA, or sort of this just mass of DNA random threads uh, without really much in the way of caps of uh, proteins, clearly obviously caps, obvious caps of proteins nearby. And they hypothesized that this was the remnants of AAV capsids that had been completely disrupted by heating. Now, UNCLE, of course, isn't using atomic force microscopy, but can still look at both of these kinds of stability using a slightly different technique. So first to look at capsid disruption during the heating, UNCLE uses intrinsic fluorescence. So proteins, even capsid proteins, are fluores slightly fluorescent when you hit them with a two, uh, 266 nanometer laser. And that fluorescence changes as the capsid proteins unfold. So as the capsid proteins unfold, the capsid is of course disrupted and UNCLE can use its full spectrum det uh, fluorescence detection to see when that happens. If you add cyber, a DNA binding dye, like for example, cyber gold to uh, an AAV sample as you heat it, what'll instead have, what'll happen is that that cyber gold will bind to released and ejected genomes and start to fluoresce. And since UNCLE has full spectrum fluorescence, it's able to measure that increase in fluorescence as DNA gets released. UNCLE software can then assign TMs based on either the change in intrinsic fluorescence or the change in cyber gold fluorescence to tell you more about first, in the first case, capsid disruption, and in the second case, genome ejection. Now I'm gonna walk you through an actual experiment we did here in, uh, at Unchained Labs using both Big Tuna and UNCLE. So with Big Tuna, we took a sample of AAV9 and buffer exchanged it into five different buffers, then concentrated it twofold. 
we took that buffer exchange and those buffer exchange and concentrated samples of AAV9 and put them into UNCLE and used it to look at uh, both capsid disruption and genome ejection TMs, looked at aggregation temperatures, and looked at DLS using the TM, TAG, and DLS application and the viral toolbox. The buffers we used in BigTuna, you can see listed here. Most of these buffers were chromatography buffers that we selected uh, based on literature values. We started with an AAV concentration of 7 times 10 to the 11 capsid particles per milliliter as quantified by an ELISA, an initial volume of 380 microliters, and a final volume of 190 microliters. These, this AAV sample started in PBS at pH 7.4 with 0.001% pleuronic. One of our buffers that we exchanged into is the same as our starting buffer, and we use this sample as a process control. You'll also see at the bottom there that citrate phosphate buffer, buffer number five, which is, of course, at a, a very acidic buffer. This was a positive control buffer that we knew would have some pretty significant impacts on AAV9 stability. We performed each of these exchanges in duplicate for a total of 10 different buffer exchange and concentration steps. And BigTuna was able to complete all of this, uh, all these exchanges and concentration steps in under two hours. You can see from the top line that we had about a 100% recovery in our PBS uh, process control, and similarly high above 90% recoveries for, four of, our, for the, uh, four of our five buffers showing a big tuna's high degree of reliability. However, you can also see that that citrate phosphate buffer had a significantly lower than expected recovery. And we'll be able to look into why that happened here in a moment. DLS is a great way of looking at a quick snapshot of your virus sample quality. Intact viruses are about 25 nanometers in size. And when you look at a DLS intensity distribution, you can actually, uh, for most of our buffers, you can see just that single peak at about 25 nanometers, indicating all of the virus was intact, nicely monodispersed, and non-aggregated. However, if you look at the red line, which is our citrate phosphate buffer, you can see a second peak at above 100 nanometers, which corresponds to aggregated samples. So, AAV9 most uh, aggregated in this acidic citrate phosphate buffer. And that actually also explains our lower than expected percent recovery by ELISA. The ELISA we used is sensitive only for intact viruses and doesn't bind virus uh, AAV aggregates. So you know, a significant portion of the AAV capsids were locked in these aggregates and therefore weren't detected by ELISA. When we compare our samples before and after Big Tuna, just in that nice, in that PBS buffer, we saw really no significant changes in bet between uh, the capsid disruption temperature, genome ejection temperatures, or looking at, uh, at its aggregation using SLS. So buffer exchange had really no impact on stability. However, what you might be noticing is that that uh, cyber gold intensity is a lot higher in the more concentrated samples. And that, of course, makes sense because there's more DNA for cyber gold to bind. We use the same uh, soap. We're going to see more fluorescence intensity. Um, with uh, the SLS results, you can also see a much higher signal. And that's because uh, if you have more particles in a sample, you're going to see more static light scattering. Comparing all of the the five different buffers post exchange to each other, we can see that for the most part, the four buffers, uh, PBS, phosphate, tris, and sodium acetate, all had very similar uh, thermal stabilities based on their caps of disruption temperatures. Really the only one that was of any significant difference was that citrate phosphate sample, our positive control. Capsid disruption curves on UNCLE using intrinsic fluorescence are fairly easy to understand. 
was a nice, simple uh, S-shaped curve that assigned a TM right at that transition moment uh, in that S-shaped curve. However, with genome ejection curves using CyberGold uh, fluorescence, the curves are sometimes not quite as easy to understand uh, at first glance. But once you know what's going on with the, pro with the AAV, it's actually a lot easier. So initially, we have some moderate level of CyberGold fluorescence. And that's because in a, this sample of AAV9, we had intact capsids con that contain genomes, some free non-fluorescing CyberGold dye, and some CyberGold dye that was bound to free DNA that was already in solution. So that's why we have a slightly higher detectable CyberGold intensity there right at the beginning of the thermal ramp. As we start to heat it, that CyberGold intensity decreased. Uh, as is expected for fluorescent dyes. As you heat them, quite often the signal decreases. But then, once we get to about 30 degrees, that cybergold intensity starts to increase again because that's where the genomes are starting to escape from our intact capsids and therefore binding to the dye and causing that increase in cybergold fluorescence. That fluorescence continues to increase as more and more of the DNA escapes from the, uh, escapes from the intact capsids, or as those intact capsids are starting to disrupt, and eventually reaches a maximum where all of the uh, genomes have gotten released and are binding to our fluorescent dye. The choice of buffer of an AAV sample has a big impact on its thermal stability, but it doesn't always have the same impact on genome ejection as it does on capsid disruption. Here, we're comparing the sample of AAV9 in PBS post-concentration to the sample of a same AAV9 in citrate phosphate buffer, which was our positive control, and looking at both genome ejection and capsid unfolding. Here, you can see that the genome ejection TM in these two different buffers had a difference of 11.9 degrees Celsius, but the capsid unfolding TMs only had a difference of 4.4 degrees Celsius. A buffer can have a significantly different impact on genome ejection than it does on capsid unfolding, which is why it's so important to look at both of these uh, thermal stability pathways. With UNCLE, we're also able to look at aggregation during thermal ramping. And here again, buffer had a huge impact. That acidic citrate phosphate buffer had a much earlier aggregation temperature than the PBS buffer did, you know, 43.5 degrees Celsius versus 74.8 degrees Celsius. And of course, this was taken, uh, this aggregation temperature was determined based on the change in static light scattering at for, of the 473 nanometer laser. So key points to take away from this study is first that concentration uh, of AAV9 in PBS had no uh, significant impact on AAV9 stability. That in this case, uh, AAV9 uh, was least stable and actually aggregated extremely early, in fact, aggregated at room temperature and then aggregate even further at about 43 degrees in that acidic citrate phosphate buffer. And I think it's important to also realize that buffers uh, in the, can impact genome ejection from AAV capsids sometimes more than they impact capsid disruption. So if you're only looking at capsid disruption, you're really not getting a full picture of what's going on uh, with your AAV sample. This means that you can combining Big Tuna and Uncle lets you fast track AAV stability. You can use Big Tuna for sample prep and buffer exchange, doing 96 different buffer exchanges very quickly and completely automated, uh, and can also follow that up with a concentration step. And then once you've done all that sample prep, you can characterize it and do a stability assessment using Uncle of all of those samples. You can do up to 48. Uh, simultaneous TMTAG measurements or viral toolbox measurements, 
or use any of the other applications that come included with Uncle. With Big Tuna and Uncle, you can choose buffers that make you're sure your AAV is well protected, so it won't aggregate or fall apart under stress. Thanks very much for your attention, and now we're going to open it up to questions. Thank you very much, Ross and Donna. We have several questions that have come in. And our first question is to Ross from Justin. For the big tuna, what is the typical range of sample recovery observed following buffer exchange? Specifically, how much variability is observed in yields as a function of AAV serotype or original buffer conditions? Um, thanks for the question. That's actually a really good one. Uh, so we typically see greater than 90% recovery uh, following buffer exchange or concentration uh, with big tuna of AAVs. And so far, we haven't seen any actual dependence based on serotype. Um, but of course, we also haven't you know, necessarily tested every single serotype and every single uh, you know, chimeric serotype and all the various mutants that are available. So if you're curious about how your particular AAV serotype or sample might behave, we can actually have our field team reach out to you and discuss setting up a uh, buffer exchange demo using Big Tuna. Also, as I covered in the webinar, there is some variability depending on the final buffer, uh, but doesn't seem to be much uh, with that initial buffer. So probably the biggest difference is that if a particular serotype is more prone to aggregation in a given buffer, it can sometimes look like that you had a lower than expected percent recovery when it's actually you know close to that when it might actually be close to that ninety percent recovery. Yeah. So uh, thanks a lot for the question. That was really great. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Francois, and this one is for you, Donna. If you start out with a buffer containing a detergent, is it then more difficult for you to completely exchange the detergent bound to the capsid itself? Uh, yeah. So Bitrina, since Bitrina uses an ultrafiltration method to remove the filtrate, so like most of the ultrafiltration devices, detergent removal is a little bit difficult because detergents can form my cells that is larger than the molecular weight cutoff for the uh, for the membrane, so it will be retained throughout the process. So, yeah, it, it will be a little bit challenging to do that. All right, thank you. Our next question is from Ben, and this one is for you, Ross. Are the uni modules single use, and if not, are they cleaned by the instrument? So, those unis are not single use, they can be cleaned, but they're not cleaned by the instrument. You have to do it by hand. All right, our next question is also for you, Ross. What AAV concentration is needed to assess stability? So um, uncles can do AAV concentrations using that dye-based fluorescence measure, uh, dye-based fluorescence, looking at uh, genome ejection, down to 5 times 10 to the 11 VG per ml. Thank Thanks for the question. Certainly. Donna, this one is for you. What if my samples have different viscosities or concentrations in a plate? Uh, this can certainly happen, uh, especially you have different particles with different formulations that you want to screen through. But for the as best practice, uh, I would recommend you try to group similar particle concentrations and type and buffers with similar viscosities together in a run, because this is the most efficient way and fastest way to finish a buffer exchange. But we know it's not possible because um, samples are always going to vary. So how does Big Tuna address that is that after each filtration cycle, uh, Big Tuna will always refill the well back to the initial volume um, before it repeats the filtration cycle again. So the wells will always, even though your wells might be at the different volume after filtration because of different viscosity and the flow rate of the sample, but there will always be restarted with the same volume again in the next cycle. So if there are slower wells, Big Tuna will extend the number of filtration cycle until the store will reach the targeted percentage exchange in the setting. So this is why it's best practice to group similar samples together, but we can certainly deal with it. All right, thank you. And we have a comment and a question. This one's for Ross from Brian. Very interesting presentation, thank you. How many different buffer formulations or types do you think we need to explore for AAVs? Is this just a few reliable options, or are the possibilities unlimited, 
And so the need for systems like Big Tuna or Uncle, what's Unchained Labs' experience with this? So thanks, Brian, uh, for the compliment. Also, actually, that's a really, that's actually a really great question. So I would say that based on the experiences within the protein world, there are a lot of different possibilities for optimizing uh, formulation buffers for AAV is similar to how there's lots of different options for like monoclonal antibodies. So I think that there's actually a lot of possibility here. I think it's also a uh, very underexplored space on how you can use optimized formulation buffers to really preserve uh, those uh, AAVs and make it so, you know, for example, they can be shipped more easily and so forth. So yeah, I think there's, there's probably a lot more we could look into uh, as, a, as a community and a lot more we can understand. And I think we're just scratching the surface of, of where we can go in that space. Um, again, thanks for that question, Brian. That was really great. All right. Thank you. Our next question is for Donna. What is the maximum number of samples and buffers Big Tuna can buffer exchange? So it depends on the, um, the consumable type you use. So if you use unfiltered 96, you can do 96 uh, independent samples with 96 different buffers in the same time. And if you use unfiltered 24, you can do 24 samples with 24 unique buffers and any numbers in between. Excellent. And Donna, just one more question to follow up. I know we've talked about it, but some clarification. Darren asks, can I still use the plate if I didn't use up all the wells in a run? Oh, certainly. Yeah, if you uh, use partial plates um, and you want to use the other unused well for the next run, you can certainly do that. Um, just go ahead and use, use the wells that you want to do. But we don't recommend after you use that well for buffer exchange, uh, we would not recommend you reuse the well that has been used, but all the other open wells, yeah, you can do. All right, thank you. Our next question is for you, Ross. Could you get B22 with AAV sample? Yes, you actually absolutely can. So Uncle does have a uh, KD and B22 application that's built into it, already comes preloaded. And we've actually done some experiments already that uh, using AAV and running those KD and B22 samples to try and look at that aggregation propensity. Again, if it's something that you're a little bit more curious about, we can have somebody from our field team reach out to you directly with some of those results and also talk to you about it a, a little in a little bit more. Thank you. All right, we have a question from Pavan. This one's for you, Donna. Do different formulation buffers need to be made prior to loading into Big Tuna, or can the instrument take in key excipients and other salts in solution form to make the various buffers that can then be used in the exchange process? So Big Tuna is for buffer exchange purpose only. We do not prepare formulation buffer on the deck. So you will need to pre-made the buffers beforehand um, prior to loading to Big Tuna. Thank you. And Ross, a question for you. What AAV standards do you use? So with Uncle, we've actually tested quite a few different uh, serotypes. So for the most part, uh, they've been from Virovec, but we've tested um, AAV1, 2, 5, 6, 8, and 9 from Virovec, as well as uh, AAV serotypes from a couple of other different vendors with several different uh, you know, genome sizes and uh, gene inserts. You know, but if there's something more specific, like a more specific serotype that you're wondering if we've checked or anything like that, that's something that we'll... We, could have our, our field team discuss with you. All right. Thank you so much. We do have a few more questions, but we have come to the end of our time with you. So I would like to very much thank our presenters, Donna Chen and Ross Walton. I would like to thank the folks at Unchained Labs for sponsoring today's event. We really appreciate all that they do. And most of all, I would just like to thank those of you who came and spent this time with us. We do live in strange times, and we know you're being pulled many different directions. So we're very grateful that you came and spent this time with us. So on behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia Series, thank you all so very much. Stay safe, and we hope to see you at future CHI webinars. Thank you all again. Bye-bye.